Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Brett Johnson, I'm Senior Associate Director of the Northwestern University Transportation Center. Uh, welcome to our Doug Hagestat Sandhouse Group uh, webinar today. Um, I'm going to turn it over to our Master of Ceremonies, Norm Carlson, in a second here. Uh, before I do that, I just want to let everyone know that uh, you can ask questions uh, during the program using the Q&A feature that you should see at the bottom of your screen. Um, please send in questions there and we'll monitor them during um, the talk. And at the end of the presentation, we will uh, address those questions one at a time. So with that, uh, Norm, I'd like to hand it over to you. Well, thank you, Brett, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, we certainly had some nice weather here the last couple of days, and we'll see what happens for the rest of the, the week. Uh, before I introduce our guest, I would just want to note that our April program, I believe it's April 13th, I'll check the date, is with Mike Nolan. Mike is the president of the uh, Northern Indiana Commuter Transportation District. And he is going to talk about the two major construction projects that they have going on on the South Shoreline, uh, which are a combined at $1.5 billion of investment in transit in Northwestern Indiana. But today we have uh, Stefan Loeb with us. Stefan is the Executive Vice President and Chief Commercial Officer for the Watco Companies, which is a company that has not only railroads, but uh, logistics facilities and uh, also some uh, car building or car repair facilities. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Before uh, he joined uh, Watco, uh, Stephen was a banker here in Chicago. He joined the LaSalle National Bank in uh, 2001 and he was lending to a number of companies and it was at that time that I was introduced to Stefan and uh, I consider him to be very, very knowledgeable on the short line industry and the railroad industry, particularly from the marketing point of view. And that's why we asked him to speak to us today because I think that there are, the railroad industry really needs to focus on marketing for future growth. And with that, Stefan, uh, we look forward to your comments. Yeah, thanks, Norm. Thanks, Brett. Uh, thanks, Joan. Uh, thanks, everyone at uh, NUTC. I'm going to share my screen here. Give me one moment. And uh, hopefully that works for everybody. Joan or somebody, if it doesn't, just shout out. But uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, again, it's uh, especially in the pandemic, it's, it's unfortunate we can't see everybody, but uh, doing something like this allows us to connect. And, and in the end, that's really what's important are the relationships and, and being able to share what I think is a, a really good story, not just for Waco, but the, the entire short line industry in general. Um, and so as we're looking for, for growth and, and exciting opportunities coming out of a, a very disruptive 2020, hopefully uh, your takeaways here are that there are plenty of those uh, in the short line space. Uh, so my agenda today is uh, to do a quick intro, uh, talk about the uh, short line industry opportunity review uh, for the industry overall, and then talk a little bit about some of the Watco specific uh, opportunities and, and some of the new models that we're seeing out there for potential growth in the short line space that, that we're doing specifically. And then, uh, as, as Brett said, hopefully have a, a nice, robust Q&A at the end. I always enjoy uh, taking questions and, and talking, uh, you know, from reviews that you actually have versus just what I, what I put out there. Uh, I was looking at some of the attendee lists. I, I know a lot of you, but just in case you don't know who I am, uh, Norm, Norm introduced me. Uh, he talked about my, my 10 years of banking at LaSalle, and, and then it, once it was acquired by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Um, the one thing I did want to point out is just, a, again, a tremendous thank you to NUTC. I, I've been heavily influenced uh, by it over, over my career. I, I remember as a, a junior uh, banker uh, getting invited to go up by an NUTC participant, Rob Hart, uh, who I was an understudy of at, at the bank. And just being blown away by by the content of the speakers and just the overall level of, of participation and participants, and it's just I'm very humbled and just have to pinch myself that that 
Northwestern would give me the opportunity today to speak. So uh, I appreciate that. And again, I just want to thank all my colleagues that spent a lot of time introducing me to Northwestern over the years. Tom O'Brien uh, is no longer with us, but but influenced all of us in the transportation banking world at LaSalle. Uh, again, Rob Hart and also Kathleen Ross. Um, it's crazy to think that uh, even though uh, banking is where I found Northwestern that I've actually been at Waco now for almost 11 years. Uh, it seems to go like in dog years. It seems a lot longer, but in other ways, a lot shorter too, kind of like the pandemic. And as I'm sure, what, as you'll find out, if you don't know me already, uh, I am a transportation dork. I love talking about how things move. I love talking about the rail system in general and customer supply chains. And I think as you look at these opportunities, one of the things um, that you'll find about short lines is that is not a unique thing. There are many of us uh, that the interest, the love, the passion goes beyond just a, a business case, and it creates a lot of the, the opportunities that, that I'm about to talk about. So let's talk about uh, the short line industry in general uh, to begin. The, the business case here uh, as I see it, and I just need to move my uh, speaker box here so I can actually see some of my slides. Bear with me. The joys of communication. There we go. Um, the shoreline space really, in my opinion, has never been set up better for, for growth and success. And it's a combination of kind of that same formula that we've been executing off of since staggers, uh, really the birth of the shoreline industry, um, but combined with a lot of new tricks that I'll, I'll get to throughout my presentation here. And, and as I'm teasing, you know, maybe even a new model that I'll walk you through, at least from Waco's perspective, could be out there. Uh, the key with this, with this, you know, kind of old tricks and, and new tricks and new model is it's executable, as we found out, even during the pandemic, which when you look at how disruptive it was, I don't think any of us have seen anything that disruptive in our lives from a business and commercial standpoint. Uh, and the key that I want to point out, because I think it's very important, is that success is driven without intermodal. Um, the shortline industry in general does not touch intermodal a lot. Um, there are exceptions, obviously, but this story is really about uh, that carload industrial products and bulk segments uh, in the industry that, uh, again, tend to get overshadowed by the intermodal growth story. Um, the other thing that I want to point out here about the business case, because I think a lot of people gloss over this, is this business case for short lines can work even without the support of macroeconomic trends. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, and, uh, a lot of us in the industry, uh, Michael Miller at Genesee, Wyoming, Eric Jacobowski, who I know a lot of you at Northwestern know at Anacostia, myself, we always participate in Tony Hatch's Rail Trends Conference as a panel, shortline panel. And people always talk to us about macroeconomic trends and what it means to our industry. And what we try and tell people is, look, there's no doubt macroeconomic trends drive a lot of our business. Uh, that is true. But the nature of how micro we are, that we can really only affect what is on our short line. We are not a network. We basically can only serve who is either on our railroad or within call it 100 miles from a transload basis, allows us through our entrepreneurial spirit to create opportunities that can offset or sometimes even completely mitigate macroeconomic factors. And so I'll use an example of uh, a white paper plant where has been in secular decline for decades, right? Well, if you have a white paper plant on your facility and you come up with a uh, unique way of serving them that takes business away from truck, you can show uh, substantial growth in a business that's in secular decline and vis-a-vis -vis the business results of our short line are better than a uh, uh, macroeconomic effect. So I just point that out to everybody because again, um, as we talk to our class one customers and partners and, and customers, macro drives the day, I get it, but short lines are very uniquely positioned to outperform macro effects because of what I talked about. All of that combined uh, produces volume growth and performance that I believe outperforms this declining macro carload data. And, and again, when you talk about people from short lines being asked to speak at things like this, the topic is always the death of the car load, decline of the car load. There's plenty of data to suggest the car load business is in decline, but I do want to say that has to be offset and you have to look at it in a different lens because you have the short line industry that is doing incredibly well and is incredibly vibrant that that's all we do. And so um, when does the effect of the short line start taking that potential decline and make it more of a growth story 
regardless of whether it does on a macro basis, the short line industry is showing that the car load business can grow when you put the right tools and the right value added uh, products around it. So the storyline again uh, is a simple execu uh, executable entrepreneurial formula that produces success. Uh, there's no magic uh, algorithm. There's not ma you know, a magic data use that we're, that we're doing. Short lines work hard, we're entrepreneurial. And again, uh, we create business uh, because we have no other options. We don't have a network. Um, this opportunity could not happen without good support. And even though in a, a fractured government uh, that we live in today, uh, we've had tremendous support through our 45G tax credit, which is a spend to get tax credit, which allows us to upgrade our track, our infrastructure, and has led to massive investment in online customers for the short line industry that is now permanent. Uh, for years, it was passed retroactively in, in one or two year uh, stints that, as you can imagine, was very hard to plan for and actually uh, invest. Now, uh, you know, it, it's permanent. That doesn't mean that, that a new Congress can't change that. But uh, while it's here, it's going to be a tremendous platform to, uh, to be able to continue to grow. And then also the Chrissy grants, which are the FRA DOT sponsored uh, uh, rail grants, which uh, Watco and Genesee and Wyoming and several other short lines have successfully applied for and received grants. Um, so great government support. Uh, as, as people who follow publicly traded stocks can attest to all investors are worried about ESG, uh, the short line space uh, specifically, and as you know, the rail industry in general has a strong ESG story. Uh, and so being able to tell this, the, the story of keeping uh, trucks off the roads and bringing more business to rail from uh, both a public policy and a customer standpoint is very popular with both. And uh, something that, uh, you know, I think a lot of people maybe don't realize is because short lines are essentially everywhere, we're kind of like the post office when it comes to, uh, you know, our, our effect on, on our, our local communities, because we are in so many places and we have that sustainable short line story of, of driving carload growth um, in, in enormous amounts of areas of, of the country in North America that not a lot of other industries have. So um, again, I, I, I know this is more about the business and commercial look of things, but we couldn't get here without, without the public support and a, and a good ESG story. Uh, no presentation about where we are in the short line industry uh, can, can be made without talking about the pandemic. Again, I want to be clear, though, I, I really want to take out intermodal here because I think there's some very important things to take away from the short line space. And again, how it's different than the macro trends that you see in the overall rail industry. Um, not to say we're not impacted by it, but I think it, it does lead to a very interesting story. Uh, the chart on the right uh, is basically Railink's shortline 2020 carload data. Uh, and as, as you can kind of see by the chart, but I'll go through the bullets, um, 2020 was impacted negatively by the pandemic overall. The short line traffic was down 6.2% uh, from uh, 2019. But what's interesting is it was isolated essentially to three commodity groups. Um, the first was coal, which as we all know is in secular decline in general. So the pandemic really didn't affect that. Um, and you can say the, the same thing for frac sand, where uh, long haul kind of white northern sand has been replaced by, uh, you know, from an energy standpoint, much cheaper to consume uh, brown sand uh, that's locally sourced closer to the wellheads that don't need to move by rail. Uh, and then the third piece is automotive, which clearly was impacted by COVID when the automotive manufacturers shut down their plants starting in about late March, right about a year a year ago, actually, uh, for, for three to four months um, that led to uh, that led to basically no one, uh, you know, shipping autos for that period. The one thing I do want to point out, though, is if you took a uh, poll of all the short line railroads out there, many of them actually saw volume growth. Because again, if you weren't shipping these three commodities, you had a pretty good shot of actually seeing uh, uh, growth and uh, incremental volume gains, which uh, I'll get to in a second. The most important thing is even after the cliff kind of fell off uh, in April and May of last year, there was a very strong recovery as you can see in the graph. Um, so by the fourth quarter, many of the segments were actually showing 
nice growth like grain, uh, which was a fantastic uh, commodity last year, um, and all the agricultural products around grain. Uh, aggregates, road construction didn't slow down. We shipped a lot of aggregates. Paper, the brown paper, the explosion of, of e-commerce certainly uh, is still going strong if you have a brown paper mill or a box plant. Uh, lumber, everyone uh, adding on to their houses, fixing their houses, being stuck at home. We saw huge gains there uh, and also petroleum. So now I'm going to pivot to the national story, which as many of you know is not so rosy. Uh, the AAR uh, total US, so again, not, not Canada or Mexico, non-intermodal carloads were actually down 13%. Uh, those numbers qu aren't quite apples to apples, but it's close enough. So look at that, down 13%. And 1.7 million car loads versus 6.2% and 258,000. Um, and the only positive category that saw uh, saw improvement was grain. So you know, and then uh, just to add on, when you use the AAR's North American total, which includes Canada and Mexico, it got a little better, but was still down 11.2% or said it a different way, much worse than what happened in in the short line space. So when you break that down, I, I know the chart on the left is, is not a cumulative. They didn't have a cumulative chart to share online. But this is if you just look at December, this is very indicative of some of the growth numbers you're seeing by the end of the year last year and, and some of these commodities. So you're seeing a rebirth. You're seeing nice gains in the short line space. In the upper right, you can see the actual units that I talked about before. And then in the bottom uh, right, kind of an interested, interesting cumulative number. So you can see. Um, Pretty much every month cumulatively was down except March, I think, when everyone didn't realize what was happening. And then uh, the plateau at the bottom was was in August. And then we did a nice job of, of fighting our way back by the end of the year to end up at down 6%. So how do short lines outperform this carload data that I just shared? Well, a, a few things are going on here that I really want to point out. And then I'm going to use specific examples so you can see how it's executed. Uh, we believe at WACO that the, the class ones optimizing really fit well into what we do, which is providing the value creating extras to the customer supply chain and that first mile, last mile, and then putting it on a very efficient, well-run class one. There's, there's actually some good value gains to be, to be had there. Uh, again, with our consistent and flexible service and our, our entrepreneurial spirit, it, it is a really nice formula where I think a lot of people like to complain about it. And I want to be clear, it's not easy. It requires constant readjustment and constant laser focus. But again, uh, when you can partner with your class one customers, uh, you, it really does drive growth. And I'll use a great example of that later in the WACA specific example. Um, here's where it gets important. Short lines have a flexible spending structure. Our investors allow us to invest, not cut. And, that, and we are incredibly fortunate to be able to say that. Uh, we deploy our balance sheets on both sides of the fence. That's a really key thing. So we're not just investing uh, in our infrastructure or in our actual right of way, but we're allowed to invest in our customers' infrastructure, in things off the railhead. And that, that provides an incredibly flexible uh, model to be able to grow. Um, we do things offline. So if class ones uh, want to get rid of extra switching, we can do a lot of the pre-blocking. We can do a lot of the ancillary services that, that aren't part of the optimization that I talked about. Um, you know, and then once that happens, again, you you deploy the the what I'll call the magic sauce that we've been doing since Shortline showed up, which was that faster, more reliable service, customized solutions. And so, you know, when the plan is executed, uh, you basically have customers that win and ship more carloads via rail. So um, that is the story. Here's here are four examples of how that actually works. So. These were uh, our 2020 American Shortline and Regional Railroad Association business development winners, and, and you see four there. Uh, the key trends I want you to focus on are, are what I'm repeating from the previous slide, and you'll catch, you'll catch the trend very easily here in a second. Uh, the first winner uh, was the Ann Arbor Railroad. That, that is a Watco property. What's interesting about the Ann Arbor is much of its growth doesn't come from actually the movement of rail, rail cars. It's the movement of vehicles. Uh, Ann Arbor's operations are, are mostly, despite its name, uh, in Toledo, Ohio, outside of an FCA Jeep plant. Uh, and we work with several of the OEMs to store, uh, customize, test, and load to ship 
uh, finished vehicles. And to do that, you need a lot of space. You need these lay down yards for vehicles where they come off the line, especially with Jeeps, they, they need a lot of customizable parts that then go back into a third party plant for those, for those parts. And so there's a lot of movement before they get railed. Well, we noticed that there was a, uh, a piece of land, it was actually an old dog track in Toledo um, that uh, was available for purchase. It was at least a mile and a half away from the railhead of the Ann Arbor, but we purchased it uh, knowing that, you know, to continue to grow with customers, we needed to provide them more space. We needed to provide them more service. Uh, a lot of emissions requirements were requiring vehicles to have a test track near their location. So it, it's a racetrack. We actually have a, a test facility on site and we provide our customers uh, at that site, not just more lay down space, but the testing and the other ancillary products that I mentioned. And it was wildly successful. We had almost the entire space leased uh, before we had even uh, gotten on site um, and, and not just with FCA, but with all the OEMs. And what's interesting is a lot of that business doesn't even go out uh, rail. It goes out truck or some other form. Uh, but the point is, is that by, by buying on the other side of the fence, not, not even adjacent to the railroad, if you will, uh, Waco through the Ann Arbor was, was able to see some pretty significant uh, revenue and volume growth um, on, on that front. Uh, moving over to uh, the upper right, uh, Carload Express is a small short line holding company based in Pittsburgh. They operate a railroad in Delaware called the Delmarva Central. They had a, an abandoned customer site with a spur track uh, that wasn't doing anything. And they had identified a, uh, a product that ships into Delaware to support the massive uh, chicken farms that are in the area, uh, basically a, a chemical product that's needed for, for the raising of chickens. And so just like Ann Arbor, they purchased the, the vacant land and built a site to attract uh, five different customers that ship this, this, this product uh, to support the, the chicken farms. And so again, uh, resulted in hundreds of carloads of growth. This was a product that was uh, consistently 100% being trucked into the market. And so being allowed to buy a facility that had nothing to do with rail other than it used to ship rail 30 years ago, um, allowed the DeMarva Central to, to uh, experience actual volume growth in a very difficult year because obviously it was in the food supply chain, um, which was very important, especially as we were all eating at home. Uh, the third one in the bottom left is a name many of you at Northwestern will know. I know Indiana Railroad participates a lot in this group. Um, I mentioned that intermodal is in a big play. Well, this is one of the railroads that was very successful using intermodal in partnership with the Canadian National. And uh, branching off that, they partnered with a third party warehouser, uh, warehousing business to create uh, basically a bulk indoor bulk transfer facility. So uh, inbound box cars, as you can see here, flat cars and other things of bulk products can get transloaded and stored and go out to the local markets. Uh, Indianapolis is a huge, uh, you know, hub and spoke uh, for, for Midwest supply chains. And so Indiana Railroad saw that again, invested off their railhead uh, with a warehouse partner um, that could then bring in additional business that probably was not touching rail before that was mostly truck. Uh, and then finally on the, the lower right, you have the Reading and Northern, they're based in the, the Northeast, Eastern Pennsylvania. Uh, they saw a major opportunity to ship steel. Uh, Normally in the past, uh, they would have found a, a third party operator uh, to provide those services. Uh, but again, then that's a customer dealing with multiple people. So uh, Reading and Northern made the investment in the equipment. Uh, they found out all the regulations and learned how to handle the material themselves to provide the service. So it's one company to deal with. Uh, and so they do all the transloading. They do all the ancillary services around the, the material handling. And they've been able to capture steel business that was not moving by rail by making those investments. Again, yes, they did do ship by rail and that's incremental, but they had to do all these other businesses that they hadn't historically done before. So again, I think these are really good examples of what I was talking about in that last slide. And so the results of, of all of this is thousands of incremental car loads, uh, millions of dollars of local investment, both by the short lines and the customers, right? That's that strong community involvement I've been talking about, um, which, which dovetails into hundreds of jobs being created. And 
again, I just want to point out, um, while these four railroads were acknowledged for their successes in 2020, all 500 plus short lines that are out there do this in some form. We do it every day and, and that's how we're able to grow and, and that's why we're so excited about, uh, about our industry. So um, this success, as you can imagine, draws a lot of interest. Uh, there have been multiple long term infrastructure funds and investors, and, and even a class one now that uh, sees investing in a short line for the reasons I just talked about uh, as a very good growth model, uh, not just a cut to cash flow model, which I think is very important as you look at, at short lines. Um, you can see the examples there, obviously Brookfield, which is a Canadian infrastructure fund purchasing Genesee and Wyoming, taking them private. Uh, First States buying uh, Patriot Rail and Ports, 3i buying regional rail and being very acquisitive of, of smaller short lines. Uh, and then the CSX buying uh, class two regional uh, Pan Am. Um, you know, it's created a lot of attention. It, it's certainly driven up prices, as you can see below. But the investment thesis, I think, again, is very positive. Uh, this thesis is built on growth. It's on volume. It's exciting to say that. It's not just, you know, operating savings and OR and all those things that, that again, uh, I'm, I'm just... I'm ready to turn the page on that. I'll just leave it at that. I think it's time to pivot to growth, as many class ones are saying, and, and this certainly shows that by the attention that short lines are drawing. Um, EBITDA multiples until I would say uh, Saturday night <laughs> uh, used to uh, imply that these short lines were trading uh, at a higher multiple than some of the class ones. That's probably changing, but what I would say there is, again, um, the value shows, and then the recent acquisition, which I'm sure people will ask me about, is showing that growth is driving the value and higher multiple that you saw over the weekend versus this, let's see how much we can still cut, uh, that the shareholders, unfortunately, are demanding our, our partners to follow. So uh, the conclusion here is even outside investors, I think, see the volume growth story and car load is there on the short line side. And, and we just hope as an industry that soon the investors that are investing in class ones allow these investments to pivot to true, true growth too, because that'll just unlock this, uh, unlock this even more as you can imagine. It's there, the growth is there. And so I hear a lot of this PSR 2.0. There is no PSR 2.0. Uh, Keith Creel said it really well yesterday on CN CNBC. We're gonna continue to optimize but we're here to grow. PSR is done. We're turning the page. That doesn't mean we can't optimize. The the, the tenants are are there. Let's be as let's be as uh, streamlined as possible. But it's time to grow because the whole story is played out, and the top line is important. And again, I think that just really helps the short line story. Okay, so let's uh, let's pivot to to Watco. Um, Watco is a company that oftentimes gets misunderstood as just a short line operator. And, and Norm, I appreciate you uh, sharing that uh, we're not just uh, we're not just a short line or, or switch carrier. That we do offer all the other businesses. But in the end, what we are is we are a service solution provider. Uh, what that means is we we transport any mode, any material in any market. We handle any mode, any material, any market, and you can keep going on down the line. Repair and maintenance, our third-party logistics business, and then we'll even design and develop all the site needs that you may have from an engineering standpoint. Uh, we serve, as you can imagine, a very diverse set of industries. Basically, every industry uh, that requires some form of material handling, uh, we are in, the, uh, we are in the, the process of or currently hauling. Uh, and it, it creates an enormous uh, visibility for size of company that we are into complete supply chains, which is what's so important in understanding your customers, not just worrying about what, you know, your little part of the business does, but what the entire supply chain does, so you can create solutions and continue to grow with those customers. We do all of this through our complete adherence to our customer first foundation principles. And I'll let you know kind of the genesis of these uh, principles later, but they're very simple. If you value your customer, if you value your people, and if you safely improve every day, you earn the right to, to do business with your customers tomorrow. And this is used uh, from you know, the person switching the car into the facility and welding the, the repair on, on the rail car itself all the way up to the corner office. Uh, this is something that just is instilled in us that we, that we truly believe in. 
you can see our uh, family of railroads here, all the different logos. Um, this is the part of the business, of course, that we'll focus on for, for this part of the, uh, the presentation. Um, but what I wanted to do is really talk about, and I teased it earlier, uh, this new short line model that we're starting to see and use two specific examples at Waco to walk you through what, what, that, what that is or what, what, what it could be. Um, we'll first talk about the Dow implant switching sites, which was a, a very public deal that, that was announced and uh, closed in, in 2020. Uh, we serve six different Dow sites now uh, and have ownership of the rail assets in uh, two sites in Texas two sites in Louisiana and two sites in Alberta. And then I'd also like to talk about a January 2021 startup, a very fresh startup, uh, which is our Dutchtown Southern line, uh, which is in Geismar, Louisiana in partnership uh, with, the, uh, with the Canadian National. The thing I want everyone uh, here to focus on is what these profit centers do, okay? These profit centers are terminal focused. Uh, they do not have networks uh, on a map. They're a dot. And most of their activity occurs on, on track and infrastructure, um, not even associated with a railroad. It's inside the customer's uh, plant and loading and unloading facilities. Um, this is truly a, a first mile, last mile concept that we're seeing. And it's all switching, extra switching, pre-blocking at an economical price, I want to add, uh, versus kind of a, a long haul, if you will, will or a line haul service. Um, in our mind, this model is a true alignment of the entrepreneurial customer service and then providing it to the class one in that long haul efficiency and network optimization where, where there's win-wins for all parties. Um, and the key thing, as we found uh, taking these over recently, is the reward for us and the railroad, all railroads, so class ones included, um, is from the movement of rail cars, not accessorial charges. And that's a real key I want everyone to hone in here as we get into the details. So here's, here's the Dow deal. Uh, you can see on the right uh, the different uh, facilities where they are, and then uh, some of the, the third-party on-site shippers uh, that, we, that we service as well in addition to Dow. Uh, the Dow deal was a, a global RFP to require and own the assets, as I mentioned, in, inside these facilities. Uh, we're tasked to perform three distinct uh, operating uh, groups, which is the rail car switching itself, uh, the storage of the rail cars, and then also the cleaning of the rail cars. Uh, this uh, facility or this operation started in uh, third quarter of 2020. And, and to realize what a big deal this was for Dow to, to partner with somebody with this type of control. Think of it this way. The six facilities produce over 91% of Dow's olefin and 96% of Dow's total polyethylene in North America. And for those of you that know Dow and, and all its machinations, this is its main business unit, um, producing product that basically drives its results in the most material way possible. So uh, total volume, as you can see from rail, is over 115,000 annual carloads. Uh, and the real key here, and I think the, the real neat thing to understand, is Dow did this to incentivize an operator by volume by allowing an operator to unlock all the rail efficiencies it knows as a rail operator, like Watco, not just the traditional industrial switching mechanism, which is just to mark up your assets less than the other guy and then operate exactly how the plant manager wants you to operate. And I'll get to that in a second, but, but because we are allowed to bring all efficiencies that we have as, as railroad operators to this, and be incentivized by growth versus just a, a you know a, a monthly fee really unlocks value for for not just Dow, not just us, but also for the class ones as well. So again, we just see this as a, a potential third generation of, of short line deals. Um, I'll go into what I mean by that in a second. Um, I, I talked the last time I spoke at NUTC, I, I kind of mentioned this multi act. Shakespearean play of short line deals. And, and I'll talk about it uh, again, just to recap. Gen one was uh, staggers happened, um, industrial implant switching carriers were allowed. Uh, the generation two was the, the outsourcing of the short lines. And then again, I think this is what I'm calling, you know, this potential gen three of short lines partnering with class ones to encourage the, the large industrial customers to adopt 
uh, implant switching short line model, uh, either through selling implant assets uh, or via short line like Dutchtown Southern accessing the customer uh, and replacing the, the current class one service. So the, uh, the Gen 1 example uh, from a WACO perspective is DeRitter, Louisiana. Uh, it was originally a Boise Cascade plant. It's now a PCA facility. Uh, we were the second third party implant operator coming out of Staggers. Uh, I think RailServe beat us out by one month. Um, and the key thing there is we signed at the time a 30 day out contract in 1983, which basically means if we didn't perform well, uh, Boise Cascade, it, it you know, could just give us notice and we'd have to leave in 30 days. And that really is what led us to our customer first foundation principles. We had to prove every day to our customer that we could add value and be a good partner over the long term. Uh, and so regardless of whatever commercial you know, arrangement we have with our customers, we treat every piece of business like we had a 30 day out contract. And we're proud to say that uh, you know, 35 plus years, almost 40 years now, this is an older slide, um, we are still operating under that same 30 day out contract. It, it's never been uh, adjusted. Uh, it's never been re rewritten. Uh, and we're very, very proud of that. But what happened here is basically the railroads incentivize these large customers through rebates to, to hire a third party operator. The railroads lowered costs dramatically by having less crews um, going into plants and gaining the benefits of more efficient point to point rail movements. And the shippers you know, got to have a better first mile, last mile with, with being able to control essentially their, their operator. And this model proved to be successful for a, for a very long time. And you can see kind of how it works on this slide. The class one gives the rebate, the industrial company gives a monthly payment to, to switch the contract switcher. The contract switcher gives entrepreneurial service back to the customer, operating and savings efficiencies to the class one. Uh, and the industrial customer gives volume growth to the class one. So you can see those starting to pop up on the bottom where you have the class one mainline, the class one branches and these industrial customers now are, are, are growing through these third party operators. The gen two example, uh, is, again, Watco played a big role um, is, you know, once the class ones gained efficiency inside the plants, um, they had to rationalize, um, you know, tons of miles as we all know in the story. Uh, and so they began contracting out uh, and selling or leasing lines to entrepreneurs, basically, you know, again, paying them a piece of the overall rate uh, to be able to operate these on an entrepreneurial basis and keep service going without abandonment. Uh, as you know, the class ones won via shedding through cost and cost gains, but also, as I was mentioning, it was, it's been quite a growth story on short lines. And so they were able to grow business as well. Uh, customers maintained and even got to grow rail service. And the short lines won because they were able to be successful. Look at just the growth, just in miles here, where it started way on the left in a small corner of, of Kansas and Oklahoma. And it's basically spawned three regional railroads uh, in the uh, Kansas and Oklahoma area for our networks through the uh, Kansas and Oklahoma, Stillwater Central, and the South Kansas and Oklahoma railroads. And you can see it here again, really the only thing different is, is now you have branch lines that are served by Waco. So now you see Waco is at the industrial customer. Waco has a branch line and is serving more customers. So we're starting to touch more and more things uh, as this model uh, continues to develop. All right, so here's Gen 3. Is this the new idea? Um, I mentioned before, Dow became the first customer to sell its implant operations and reward that operator uh, via volume and efficiencies that it drives. Uh, again, much like a short line railroad, much like that Generation 2 example. Um, they're incentivizing us again through volume and payments versus us just marking up our assets and getting paid on a monthly basis. You know, Basically what that means is it never forces us as a contract operator to try and be better but when you're getting paid per car, you know, and, and you have the ability to run it as a railroad, not how, you know, the, the plastics production ma manufacturer thinks he wants the plan or she thinks it wants run, it's unlocked amazing efficiencies um, as part of this transaction. We also want to make sure that we're interacting with the class ones uh, that serve the plant 
uh, very well. So the new structure allows us to look at pre-blocking, more flexible interchanges, um, that creates wins for all three parties. So from our perspective uh, in the Dow deal so far, the customer is won uh, by being compensated for its real assets, obviously, and then receiving better service and opportunities to grow with an aligned owner operator uh, incentive per car load versus, uh, excuse me, per car load versus a flat fee that we've seen in kind of the legacy switching model. Uh, the class ones win by receiving additional operating efficiencies in plant and outside the plant, as well as additional volumes driven by the new operator. And obviously we win by aligning with a true rail partner, our customer, to grow the business while creating the efficiencies and unlocking the value for all, all three parties. And this is just an illustration of that. And, and again, what, what's key here is look at all the touch points now, right? Watco is, is, is kind of everywhere on the supply chain other than that very optimized class one mainline where uh, we work very well with our class one customers. Okay, and to uh, the wrap up the last example, I wanna touch on our newest addition from the railroad side, which is the Dutchtown Southern. Uh, Railroads love to show maps of their railroad and unfortunately there's not much to see because what you see in this map is essentially the Touchtown Southern. Uh, again, when I talk about more of a dot than a network, this is what I mean, but I, I want to show you this because you can see all the different industries here and customers that are marked through our GIS system, or I guess this is a, a Google map, but same thing where all the different customers are. Um, it was CN's former Geismer, Louisiana terminal a large serving yard with multiple on-duty switch crews and assets stationed there to serve these customers. Uh, Watco entered into a lease with CN and, and began uh, operations there on January 16th. And like I said, it's only on two miles of CN track. The rest of the track are industry leads and in-plant um, uh, right-of-way that are, that are owned and, and maintained by the customers. Uh, we serve nine large petrochemical shippers here. And uh, based on the annual numbers, uh, you know, from, from the past, this line serves about 35,000 car loads per year. Um, we stepped into essentially CN's first mile, last mile here uh, with three locomotives and two crews. And, and we've essentially are providing seven day a week service, no miss switches. Uh, we provide the opportunity to, to switch multiple times a day uh, and whenever the customer really needs it. And so, when you look at it so far, uh, again, you start looking about how everybody wins through a short line model, which is why we're here today. Uh, CN wins by generating all the efficiencies and operational savings by repositioning all its people, locomotives, and assets to the main line. Uh, the customers win by getting consistent seven day a week service. Uh, we don't miss, miss switches. We show up when, when, when we're asked and we're flexible in providing extra switches and we do it affordably. We do it essentially uh, for the same, the same rate as, as you know, our normal uh, tariff. We're not looking for ancillary charges uh, to make our business model here. It's all providing the movement of car loads and doing it incrementally to win. The beauty of the model I've been talking about since I first started here. So initial returns, staggering growth potential. And I'd like to point out, uh, I heard from, from somebody today that on CN's earning call, they actually mentioned the Dutchtown Southern today about a way to win. And so uh, don't just take me raw rawing for my own cause. I was very happy to hear that the CN told its owners that they believe in this as well. So this is really exciting stuff. So uh, concluding points, um, again, I've been saying it, uh, but I'll just repeat again, short lines win with a simple model. I know a lot of you, uh, after I make speeches like this, go, well, it's really, you know, what you're talking about really isn't special. I, I know it's not special, but it really goes to show that when you have that entrepreneurial spirit, you're willing to work hard and you're willing to constantly redevelop your model, uh, there's a lot of growth. And so uh, if it's simple, fine, I'm happy it's simple. It makes, makes our lives easier, I guess, right? Um, you know, again, everyone wins in this scenario except truck, which I think all of us in the rail industry are, are happy with. I'm sorry for all the truckers that are on the, the call, um, but that's just is what it is. We want to drive business to rail here. Um, again, the key is consistent, affordable service with the focus on winning via volume and, and not ancillaries. That's really the key. And uh, use the ancillaries as a tool for better behavior, not as a, a revenue source and focus on the entirety of the customer supply chain. I, I mentioned that briefly earlier, but that's really 
what's important here. Looking at all the four railroads that won the awards that I touched on before, they, they were looking at the entire end-to-end -end solution, not just what their railroad could do. And that's really what leads to success. Um, so in conclusion, uh, as I say here, short lines can grow in a carload business that some could argue is in secular decline uh, on a macro basis. And we do that uh, in general uh, through this third generation model. And, and I'm sorry, we do that in general and also potentially through this generation three model um, as we continue uh, to succeed as the class ones pivot to growth. I just see that as an additional opportunity uh, to, to be more successful and, and really turn the macro story of the car load around because we certainly see the positives of it in the short line space. And so um, with that, that is, uh, that is my presentation. Um, I appreciate everyone's time uh, as, as I went through it and I'm happy to turn it over to uh, ask uh, or answer any questions that you may have. Hi, Stefan. Thanks. Thank you for that uh, presentation. Um, I do have a couple of questions that have come in, so I'll read those off to you. Um, but just want to remind the audience, if you do would like to ask a question, uh, please use the Q&A uh, feature at the uh, bottom of your uh, Zoom window. So uh, you were talking about car load, <coughs> uh, Stefan. And the first question from Chris asks, uh, does the closure of class one hump yards as a part of the uh, precision scheduled railroading uh, hurt the ability for carload traffic to grow long-term? Yeah, good question. It, it really depends. And what I mean by that is, you know, the, what we found in general, depending on where you are in their network, the block swapping and, and some of the things that have replaced hump yards um, has actually either been neutral or somewhat beneficial, I think, to total transit times um, that we've seen. But, but I, I don't want to just paint a totally rosy picture. We have certain cases where closing several hump yards, especially um, kind of the, the railroads that are still going through PSR, um, have closed substantial railroads, especially in the East Coast where uh, you know, again, you, you have a much more concentrated, complex network. We've seen some, some real challenges and have lost traffic that way. So like with anything, it's a mixed bag. And so you can either, as I mentioned earlier, you can either complain about it and just scream about PSR, or you can continue to, to figure out innovative ways, maybe not even through rail, uh, to continue to serve and grow with your customers. So um, I, I would say it's both. We've seen some improvement, but we've also seen some, some major disruption as well. Uh, Brad, it really just depends on uh, which class one you're dealing with, what kind of stage of, of PSR they're in, and then just the complexity of their network, I think, really drives how that affects the customer supply chain. Thanks, Stefan. Let's go on to the next question from uh, Thomas Cornelli. Cornelli. Um, he asked, do you think uh, that a change in federal policy for removing paper barriers to interchange and encouraging end-to-end -end cooperation across neighboring short lines, special, especially those under common ownership, would be a meaningful contribution for developing marketable service plans? Yeah, it's it's an interesting question, and and what I would say is, you know, Watco's view is we are here to fill a niche and not become, you know, the next Class One railroad. Class One railroads are are very good at what they do. They do the interstate commerce, the long haul, and so you know, from a regulatory perspective, I actually get very frustrated when certain short lines, you know, kind of put a dog in a fight that they shouldn't be fighting. And there's a recent example of that up in, up in New York um, where there were some things filed and, and the board agreed or the, the majority agreed on something where I, I think they didn't really have a fight. I, I think you know we want to be good stewards of the industry. Um, everybody who signs up for those types of agreements should know what they're getting into. They shouldn't look for more um, because again, you know we're not trying to replace any of our partners or customers, we're just trying to provide great service for our online customers. And so that is where our focus, at least at Watco is going to be, uh, is to be good partners with the class ones um, and play within you know, the structures that are governed to allow us to, to have opportunities. Uh, because I'll, I'll use Dutchtown as a great example. If CN shareholders and CN's management wanted to serve 
the customers at Dutchtown the way we do, they would have done it. But their customers and OR focus do not allow them to. So they've allowed us to do it. But does that mean that I should be allowed to suddenly open up access to other railroads because of that? I, I don't think so. And so I think we have to be very careful how we uh, communicate and, and as an industry. And specifically for WACA, we want to continue to show that we're partners and not not looking to to do some of the things that were brought up in the question. So that I know that was a long-winded answer, but that's how I feel about it. Thanks again. Uh, from Bond French uh, says, thanks, Stefan. I really enjoyed your presentation. Could you explain in the Dow situation how WACO does the switching that is more efficient than the plant manager would think appropriate? Yeah, Bond, great question. So think about the, the plants that have had, basically they've been controlled by the, the a plant manager who's focused on just plastic production. And so when you look at the switch moves that were being required by the industry operator, you know, as a third party contractor, you basically have to execute the plan given to you. And if you don't execute it, even if per se you're driving value, that, that was always looked at as a bad thing. What Dow has essentially said is, is you operate it. You, we have certain KPIs that we're going to measure you on a, you know, almost on an hourly basis. If you hit those, you can run this any way you want. And so what we found at one particular site, for example, uh, Dow was saying, you know, they're essentially 98%, 97% utilized. Uh, and, and to unlock more utilization, it was going to cost billions in plant modifications and track relay and, you know, additional crackers and all sorts of things. And just looking at it, going, nah, if, if you just move, how, if you just switch how the trains move or how they stage empties or how um, they don't run all the way across the plant in certain situations, um, again, running it just is how we would, uh, again, building up with our knowledge of just running the railroad, maybe doing more interchanges to get some of the outbound cars that are loaded out of the way, just unlocks all this additional capacity that essentially is for free. Dow sold, you know, they even, you could argue, got paid to unlock some of their capacity by picking this. And we're just scratching the surface of that. That's really, I think, the exciting piece of this new model. If more people were, were going to follow it is, is where you're going to see a lot of the long-term value created. Stefan, the next question is from Scott Sigmund. Uh, he says, with the third uh, gen model focused on industrial sites, as you described it, has there been a been potential for that model to be used within ports with usually very different inbound and outbound commodities uh, for connectivity to longer haul operations. Yeah, and and I think you know you've seen that uh, you've seen that in certain cases. Like I'll I'll use uh, Anacostia as a great example. You know they've they've been operating the port of LA Long Beach for years, and I think have unlocked tremendous value there uh, in terms of you know having that. Uh, that short line entrepreneurial spirit in a very large, you know, port, both on an intermodal and bulk basis. So yes, um, I wouldn't get too caught up in just, you know, in industrial site, it can be ports, it can be, uh, it can be terminals, it can be yards, uh, it can be all sorts of things. Basically, the, the simple part of it, though, is, is, you know, the short line delivering on that last mile, right? It's kind of the actual, it's, you know, in the Amazon supply chain, it's not the Amazon plane, it's not the Amazon distribution center, it's literally that Amazon truck putting the box on your door. That's essentially what, what I'm talking about, and it can take on many different forms, I think. And so related from uh, Phil, Philip Molesner. Uh, he said, he asked, do you see this Gen 3 model applicable to grow overall intermodal as well? We know you didn't spe speak about intermodal today. Um, yeah. If not, any thoughts on what would be needed to grow that area for short lines? Yeah, I have to raise my hand a little bit here and say I'm, I'm not an intermodal expert. I'm sure uh, folks that are much smarter than me, like Larry Gross, may may disagree or beat me on the head for this. But, you know, I I don't know. I think it could, but but, you know, so many of the rail carriers these days are just focusing on these, you know, 1 million lift facilities and, and, and simplifying the OD pairs, that that's a challenge. So it would take a, a, a railroad that would, would want to diversify and, and you know, uh, make more complex its network to be able to do that. Uh, and I just don't know where that would lead that, but that's what it would take. It would take a, a, you know, a railroad that would want a more complex intermodal network with more OD pairs to do that. 
versus running these massive sites to to try and generate you know the the the, the efficiencies that they've tried to do so far. All right, another question related to carload from Ed Mosser. He asks, um, <clears throat> do your tariff charges for carload service, such as at Dutchtown, result in higher overall charge for a carload, equal charges or lower? Is your customer the shipper or the railroad? Are these through rates or a combination of rates? Is this a question you can address? Uh, rates are dangerous, uh, and as somebody I'm thinking, and it, it, you know, when the AAR uh, general counsel yelled at me once that I was in conflict with, uh, you know, with with the um, uh, antitrust briefing, I actually successfully argued I wasn't, but I am very aware. Here, here's what I'm going to say. Again, the key for how these succeed is you have to be economical with how you structure everything, and so again, it, it's it, it's not, uh, a customer can't feel like they're punished for an extra switch. A customer can't feel punished if they don't receive consistent service. So what I would say is it's structured so that if you serve the customer consistently and if you um, do everything economically, uh, and so the customer then pays you to move cars versus paying these ancillaries where they don't receive any value, that's that's the the uh, that that's the, the 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 kind of framework that creates the success, but in terms of specifics, I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna touch on them. Up, well, you're on mute, Brett. That's probably a smart move. Um, here's another question related to your presentation um, from Bill Stevens. How many opportunities are there like Dutchtown Southern? Is that model broadly applicable or only really found in a few spots on each class one? And can you quantify your staggering volume growth outlook for Dutchtown? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna quantify it, but it, it will be significant. Um, in terms of the opportunity, you know, as I as I was just talking about, I don't want to make it sound like it's just an area like Dutchtown where you have a yard and a bunch of customers. I mean, it could be almost anything, and I think that's the the neat thing about the uh, the the simple version of this. I think it's just the, the change is is looking not at a branch line like a lot of us on the short line side. Like you know, I'll pick on Jacobowski. We like to look at maps and say, oh, which which branches could we maybe take over? That's not this, right? This is, we have five or six jobs or three jobs at one site, you know, one location. It's, it's a, it's kind of a mess. The operating guys, uh, it's, it, 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 it's a, it's a problem. It's not running that fluid network that they like to focus on. That's where this can be installed. And that's where the success can really be brought. Because again, all the things that we're bringing that I mentioned unlock the value. So to answer Bill's specific question, I think it can be in, in hundreds of locations per class one. It is just a matter of, you know, who wants to do it and, and how much value they can get out of it and how much value they think the customers can get out of it. But um, we stand ready. I, th I think this is something that'll keep us very busy on throughout the years here going forward. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to steer to some more general questions uh, for you when the first one's from Milan it says excellent presentation. Um, where have you seen opportunities for new technologies, uh, either in your assets wayside systems or network optimization solutions that could help aid accelerate volume growth for the short lines. Great question. Uh, I'm sure if Tony Hatch is on he's probably like why haven't you talked about rail pulse yet so. Um, you know, one of the things that that Watco and another short line uh, company, Genesee and Wyoming, have made significant investments in, uh, in conjunction with uh, two of the largest rail car owners and Class One Norfolk Southern, uh, is what we call Rail Pulse, which is an industry consortium to equip rail cars with uh, sensors that do two things: one, uh, basically show where 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 they are, and then also show what health they're in. And the whole key there is when you look at our competition in truck and you look at the telematics and you look at the predictive analytics and you look at all the data that trucks are getting because their tractors and trailers have sensors, it's really putting us at a disadvantage. So, so the number one technology in Stefan's opinion uh, is to get rail pulse going, equip all the rail cars in the fleet. Uh, and then, because again, you're not only monitoring loads, you're also monitoring empties. Where, where Waco and Genesee I think lose most of our business is when we can't tell customers how many empties we have pointed at them um, to be able to uh, win business. And so when you when the 
uh, shipper calls in the morning and you can't tell them how many uh, empties are pointed her way, she's going to order a truck and we lost that business. So um, doing that, that unlocks a whole bunch of other things for short lines, including much better visibility on interchange performance, uh, customer service focus on actual growth, not trying to help third-party logistics customers backfill very outdated steel roads data. There's just a whole bunch of things that, that Rail Pulse helps with that we're very excited to do. So that, that's answer number one. And then I think, uh, you know, everybody, I'm going to throw something out there that I still don't know where this is going to be. I just want everyone to think about this. So no follow on questions, just think about it is everybody likes to talk about autonomous trucks, right? And autonomous trucks are coming and it's in autonomous vehicles that, you know, it's too big of a business not to focus on, but everybody assumes that rail will sit there and not do anything when they say it's a threat. And by the way, I'm not saying it isn't a threat, but there is a huge opportunity for autonomous vehicles or some sort of new autonomous drone technology in rail. And what I would argue uh, with is just think of an example is think about that in-plant switching I was talking about. If you had rail cars that could somehow move themselves or move with, a, with some sort of contraption where you don't need a locomotive, right? Think about the unlocked potential you could have there versus what's happened since railroads showed up, which is essentially the horse and carriage model just with a locomotive and cars. If you could eliminate that horse, it really shows me there's a lot we can do. So I, I think some sort of adoption of autonomous technology uh, is going to be huge. But the the number one thing is being able to have rail car visibility. I want to be very clear, that's different than how a lot of the class ones look at it, which is we have PTC and we have great telematics based on our locomotives. You do, and it's great, but it doesn't tell my customer where it is when it's on my railroad. And how many times is the car actually in a consist with the locomotive? Hence why we need rail pulse. So that, that's my long-winded answer. Those are my two ideas. So Stefan, there is a follow-up question, but no, it's not <laughs> autonomous. Yep. Uh, Stephen Harrod asks, how is rail pulse different from existing rail car tracking with RFID? Yeah, so basically the, the key thing here is it's going to have geofencing um, and it'll basically be in a, um, uh, a, a serving site that is allowable by Raillink. And so everybody who's part of the rail car movement can access the data. And so the key thing from a short line perspective is it, it's through a platform that, uh, that everyone can share that's allowed to have the data run by an entity um, backed by Railink, where that's where, think of it as the clearinghouse, it would be the clearinghouse here, so it's industry uh, accepted. And then from my standpoint as a, sh as a short line, um, with the geofencing, which RFID and some of the, the other items may do, but they don't address it on the global scale, is be able to go to my class one partners and talk about interchange performance and being able to go to the customer and actually have real demurrage discussions because it's not gray anymore. Did I constructively place the car or not? Um, did I forget to serve you? Did the car go in and you did sit on it for three days? You know, it, it, it'll, it, the technology is much more specific to solving those than current platforms. And I, again, I know a lot of current platforms can do it. It just doesn't do it in a way where the whole industry and the different parties can share. Because the number one goal of Rail Pulse is to grow industrial products traffic. And so the way we do that is by sharing the information with all the railroads in the route, with the shipper, with third-party logistics companies that are maybe helping one of us, um, and do it through a clearinghouse where it's approved, like through railing. So that's really the, you know, I, it, you know, again, I, I hate to I hate to give Tony Hatch credit publicly sometimes, but I'll give him a lot of credit here. A lot of this is more of a diplomatic mission, I think, is the term he coined than actual technology, because you're right, there is a lot of tech of the technology that's already there. The key is doing it in a diplomatic form that all parties in this very complex rail space can share the information. Thanks, Stefan. Um, Greg Wright, Wright um, would like to know what Watco's vision is on decarbonizing short lines. Uh, our first email about that went out like two weeks ago. <laughs> Um, and, and I joke about it, but that's going to, that is going to be something we, uh, as an executive team are going to spend a lot of time on. Um, so I don't know yet, but I, that, that will play a big 
piece of, of not just Waco, but the entire industry. And uh, it's going to be very interesting to see where that goes. I'm excited to be a part of it. And again, it's just part of this whole ESG discussion. And so when I make kind of crazy claims about uh, you know, not having locomotives and having some sort of battery powered assist vehicles, that's this is exactly why I'm bringing this up, right? I mean, there, there is a carbon issue that we all are going to have to address at some point. But I do not know. I don't have a lot of specifics to share right now. No problem, Stefan. Um, Andrew Cornelli asks, in regards to a full service business model, what are the challenges to providing car supply to facilities? How does WACO work uh, with the network priorities of the class ones? Yeah, I think that that's, again, one of the benefits of Rail Pulse is, with, with, is we can see everything um, you can just work better together. And so, you know, as, as everybody I'm sure here knows, you know, the class ones now own less than half of the rail cars. So it's not just about the class ones, it's also about the customer's private fleets. So that that's a two headed monster you have to manage. Um, you know, with, with the class ones, again, it's, it's uh, right now we have to do it on, you know, we, we connect with all seven class ones and we, we have to know and use seven different platforms um, to be able to order cars in and manage them and, and work with class ones on that, as well as the private fleets of all the customers. So um, it, it's it's difficult, which again is why if you get a better reporting clearinghouse system like RailPulse, uh, we see it as being much easier, uh, much more beneficial. And again, not just for us, but for the customer, because they're not using so many different platforms now. They're really just using one and then can layer on whatever third-party assistance they need to generate the benefits. But their their info is now all, all going to be centered in one place. That's one of the real benefits, I think. Here, let me... So, <clears throat> Joe Olson... Um, has a funding question. He says, if and when there are new dedicated grant funding from rail from Washington, would Waco lead capital projects for his family of railroads centrally planned? Or would each short line railroad lead uh, any of those new capital projects? Just kind of get a sense of how you manage yeah, good, good question. So the, the, the grants, the grants have a, a very local flavor to them, at least how they are today. And, and I don't see that changing where, you know, the, the, the DOTs and, and, you know, all the letters that are required in support have a big local flavor to it. So it's definitely not, you know, what I'll call a corporate uh, solution. Now, having said that, you know, our, our government affairs team uh, is, is the one that does a lot of the heavy lifting, but I'll, I'll say all the local engineering, the environmental impact, all the things um, that, that get the grant to, to ground, if you will, all come from the local railroads. So it's a mix. It, it's our corporate government affairs, helping with the application, helping with, um, you know, all of the, the me mechanics to actually get it done, but with a lot of heavy lifting on a railroad by railroad basis. And so for, for all short lines, it, it's the individual railroad that is the benefactor of the grants the way they're currently set up. Thanks, Stefan. Uh, John Plant would like to know, based on looking back at uh, Friday's large proposed merger that's been announced, um, is there a chance that short line success tempts class ones to uh, get more into the acquisition mode of short lines? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, uh, at Rail Trends, you know, Jim Foote said he was a buyer, not a seller. Um, and, and so I think he he confirmed that at least through his through his his public comments. I, I instead of looking at it as just class ones looking to buy short lines, what I would say is I think the key is is that again um, I'm going to use uh, Mr. Creel's uh, public comments yesterday on CNBC. You know, it was funny because uh, the the uh, anchor she kept trying to have him talk about PSR and he was all about growth, 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 growth. And if you look at that, you know, 700, 800 million, forgot the exact number they mentioned in synergies, he was very clear. He's like, less than a quarter of that is operating synergies. This is an end-to-end -end merger with revenue growth. And it's like, you know, I got a little teary-eyed. I'm like, oh my God, you know, we're fine. Cause you know, we've been waiting for this for so long. So, um, you know, I, I, to answer the question, I, I think class ones will look at, at acquiring rail, whether it's, you know, class ones or short lines or regionals, it's, it's a growth story now. It's not a cut to growth story. Uh, and, and it's looking where they can generate volumes. And so I think in the, as CSX said, 
they looked at the Northeast, they looked at Maine, uh, and they saw, you know, some traffic moves that would be incremental. And so it was worth the, the price to them to, to buy Pan Am. Um, and I think you'll continue to see that because, it, you know, everybody is now seeing, as I mentioned in my comments, that there is growth out there, particularly in industrial products in bulk, um, and they're looking to execute it. I think their challenge is just getting over that final hurdle of this PSR, you know, ratio that we're all kind of waiting for them to. And, and the, I, I just hope the, 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 the management at the class ones know exactly what to do. And, and we have great partnerships with them and we'll execute. It's just when will their investors allow them to do that? And I think we're starting to see it. Here's another uh, Washington oriented uh, policy question from Scott Sigmund. And he says, what do you see as the next meaningful collective short line industry government affairs priorities? Great question. Um, we are actively lobbying and, and talking to people as this transportation bill, reauthorization bill appears to be a, uh, a real priority right now. Um, it, it kind of falls down into both tactical and strategic desires. I think, I think the big thing is, again, just making sure that from a regulatory environment that we continue to not be overly regulated, um, you know, that we continue to uh, be as competitive to truck as possible. Um, you know, our, our big one, is, as I talked about, was 45G, and now that's permanent. So we, we got our big win. I think the biggest ones still out there are truck size and weight. You know, trucks already don't pay nearly their weight, uh, pun intended, and to allow bigger trucks out there that'll tear up the roads more and compete better with us is not what we want to see. So we'll be very actively focused on that because there, there are a number of truckers, they're, you know, their economies and business is, is a lot worse than I think what I just shared. Well, that doesn't mean we should just allow them to have bigger trucks that tear up our roads. So that, that'll be a big one. And then, uh, you know, again, I think this, this environmental thing is very interesting because environmental now, especially in this administration, is both a positive, but it could, it could also be a negative, you know, what, or not necessarily a negative, but a new challenge, what will be thrown on us like carbon taxes, like zero emission uh, locomotives, uh, and then just in general, um, you know, again, making sure that from a regulation standpoint, it doesn't hurt our business to serve customers. Most importantly, though, is as you look at autonomous trucks and some of the things the trucking industry is doing for us not to lose that ESG advantage I talked about before. And so making sure that this isn't really government, but, but it's policy is to make sure that we're always trying to be as a, a clean and efficient as possible so that we don't lose that advantage. Stefan, you've been answering questions for almost a half hour and <laughs> on the hook for almost an hour and 15 minutes here. So I'm going to try to wrap it up with a couple of uh, operation related questions and I'm going to hand it over uh, to Norm. Um, <clears throat> George Gownley asks, he said, you know, how much of your total traffic um, do you have WACO operations at both the origin and destinations? And is this a, um, is this a, a marketing advantage for you? I do not have that answer. Um, one of the reasons why is, is in a way, yes, multiple touches are great. And we always want to, to provide all the services we can, but, but we don't look at it necessarily like a bank that's cross-selling. We look at it as what do you need? And, and what I what we talk to customers, the commercial team at Waco talks to customers very differently than a lot of other commercial teams. You know, we don't sit there and go, how do we get more of your, your modal wallet? You know, that's the question everybody likes. We don't do it that way. We go, what, what is your problem? And, and where, what keeps you up at night? What are some of the things that we can do to help? Even if it has nothing to do with where we serve you today. And we build up solutions around that. So those solutions may not touch anywhere else. It may be a solution that requires lots of different Waco products, but what we sell is, is completely a la carte. And so um, I will tell you to answer the question, we do track it. If you look at our top 10 customers, all but one has at least three of our, our different service units, which includes six at this point, as I showed in the slide. So we cross sell very effectively, but we don't demand it, if that makes sense. It's whatever the customer wants. 
Stephen Herod asks, how do you manage crew assignments at so many locations? Uh, what's the minimal feasible traffic at a particular location? Yeah, each each railroad is manager, uh, managed by a general manager who's basically in charge of the railroad. So uh, it, it's basically when I called it a profit center earlier, that's how we look at it. So each each business is its own business. It's its own P&L. And so they're empowered to, to operate. Uh, you know, to the best of what the customer needs are and, and for us to be, uh, you know, a profitable ongoing uh, business. So uh, it really runs the gamut, as you can imagine. Uh, we have railroads like the Mississippi Southern um, that, uh, you know, it's kind of an out and back operation on the south end of the railroad and has been for years. Uh, we have a 700 mile regional railroad up in Wisconsin that has multiple crew starts, has road trains, you know, that don't switch. They're basically just moving traffic from one, uh, you know, uh, area to another and into Chicago and back. So um, it, it's, and as you can imagine, that requires a different general manager, right? The general manager of the Wisconsin and Southern uh, has a totally different job than the general manager of the Mississippi uh, Southern. And it's just part of shortlining where you really have to be in our minds uh, decentralized from that standpoint to run the business the right way. So um, there isn't, <clears throat> there isn't a model. It's just what each operation needs. We try and stand up the people and the assets um, best to, to be in a position to succeed and then support it corporately from a, you know, financial and commercial standpoint. Thanks, Stefan. Um, here's the last question I'm going to throw at you today from David Wilson, uh, who asked, though many technologies have evolved for customer communication, do you still have uh, real life people that customers can talk to, particularly um, when service doesn't go as planned? The, the scariest thing to me is as you see millennials get into the workforce and they're starting to get into the traffic departments, they use phones, but they do not call. They don't use their phone for a phone. And, and the trucking industry has done an incredible job of basically putting apps together that allows them to order freight with, without ever picking up the phone. And, and my whole point, David, it's a great question with RailPulse is, you know, to your point to get a rate, you still got to pick up the phone. Well, at some point, you're going to have a bunch of millennials that go, I, I don't pick up the phone. So we're going to lose business just because we still use phones. And so um, that's what's so important about getting good data is then you can create your own platforms to basically stand up technology that, that the people that we're serving are going to demand. And it's happening. We're seeing it. And so, yeah, you'll always have a customer service department that'll pick up the phone. But man, we cannot put rates through and get answers back that way anymore. It's just, it's going to kill the industry because if it's not, if, and it's not even like a web portal. It's like, if it's not an app, they're not using it. And we have plenty of customers that, that show us that. Um, so that, that's my simple answer is we, we've got to step up our game as an industry, no doubt about it. Thanks, Stefan. Norm, I'm handing it off to you. Well, Steph, that was truly an outstanding presentation. And we certainly put you through the mill with all of the questions, but your last comment was really uh, op my, uh, mind opening or mind blowing both. And uh, from my perspective, I think the message that the industry is focused, the rail industry is now focusing on growth and is putting PSR behind us is a wonderful, wonderful message and uh, thank you for sharing that with us and thank you for making such a great presentation. Uh, our, our next meeting will be April 13th. As I said earlier, uh, we will be having Mike Nolan talking about the expansion on the South Shoreline, both the new line and the double tracking project. And we're working on a panel for May that is going to be more focused on logistics and Brett and I are working with a, a very good friend, common friend who uh, will be leading that panel. So thank you for your time. Thank you for spending with us and we look forward to seeing you in April.